Hello, everyone, and welcome to Talking About Survivor. I am Christiana Ellis. And I'm Mike Mateen. Tonight, we are back talking about the premiere of Survivor, Island of the Idols. No longer are we required to make snap judgments of the contestants. Instead, we make judgments based on heavily edited 30-second uh, chunks of actual footage. Yep. But, you know, they're actually playing now. I, people get this. I don't think it's uh, unclear. So, uh, but we're here. There's The show is actually back now, and we have actual content to talk about. Uh, so, but let's, let's just, uh, high level impressions as, as a first episode, how are you feeling? Where, where's your head at? Uh, I'm happy with it. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think the, at least in the, in the short term, you know, with what we've seen, the idea of getting the strong personality returning players in a different mechanism so that we still get to enjoy them like commentators that we discussed but having all new players on the actual beach uh, is is good. It's it's refreshing to have a whole bunch of new people that we don't know and we get to learn about and don't have any kind of predisposed, you know, storyline isn't, oh, so-and-so did this, like, are we going to work with them or work against them? Like, none of that exists. Right. It's all fresh, new group forming, uh, and that's fun. But yet, like I said, we get to see Boston, Rob, and Sandra, and the, and the way that they set that up, it really let them play to their strengths. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, well, obviously, we'll discuss it in a little more detail of what actually happened there. But I thought it worked really well, at least this time. I don't, you know, I'm reserving judgment till we've seen a few more of people go over there if it gets stale or if it, they try to get mm -hmm. too creative with it. But but for this first one, it worked really good. Um, they were really great with the contestant. They were great in their kind of commentary after. Um, I like that they do the kind of debrief with them, you know, to figure out what, you know, what they need to help them with. I think that's, that's going to get, that part should get cooler as more things are going on. Um, I think they did an amazing job of letting us actually get a feel of some of these people, even though it's, all brand new people who we know nothing about, you know, I, I felt like it was a good intro. Like we don't know everybody, but I mm -hmm. feel like there's, they, they did a good job of picking a couple of personalities to really run with. And we don't feel as confused about who everybody is at the end of the episode. It allowed me, you know, it was nice that we did that pre-show so, er, so late actually, or early <laughs> close to the show. Yeah. Because, you know, I kind of remembered some of my predispositions on some of them and, and some of them s supported things I thought were good about them. Some blew me away with what I, I didn't expect. Um, and we can talk through all of them, but I, I feel like even, even getting the, the, the two challenges in there, you know, and the immunity idol thing, they still managed in all in an hour and a half to get us a good uh, view of everything. And there was some good survivor being played. I mean, I think the, the choices that they came down to were good, and and I I, I like the decision they made, but that's mm -hmm. just my personal. But I think I think that they put themselves in the right spot. Like they're they're playing correctly, even though they're all new players. Yeah. Um, nothing just ob obscurely like oh we have to take out the strongest person right away, or <laughs> we need to you know keep the tribe strong at the expense of the camp life. No, none of that. It was actually like hey, what makes the most sense for all of those considerations? You know. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, I mean, as a kind of a long summary, but I, I, <laughs> I those were my notes of how sure. I felt. After. Those yeah. were the ideas that just had to come bursting out yeah. to be expressed. Uh, so I think something that I've talked about a couple of times in first episodes of, you know, every time we start a new season is that I sometimes find, uh, not that I, so I don't want this, this sounds more negative than I mean it. I don't miss the show when it's not on. Like when a season finishes, it's usually like satisfying, you know, kind of in the same way that when you watch a movie, you don't necessarily say that was great. That makes me want to watch another movie right now. 
right? Sometimes maybe it does, yeah. but lots of times you feel like, I've watched a movie. Ha, ah, now I'm done. I've just eaten a great meal. I'm done now. Yep. And I feel and I feel satisfied for a while. And I'm so I'm not really feeling the lack of it afterwards. But almost always by the time a new season is coming around and then, you know, gets started up, I'm like, Oh yeah. Just enough time for me to get hungry again for <laughs> Survivor. Um yeah, I I agree with you that I think uh, it remains to be seen how it will continue to play out over the rest of the season, but at least as implemented in this first episode, I like how they're using Boston, Rob, and Sandra. I think the two of them are well chosen, both as people that we kind of would say, yeah, okay, that's legit, that they they would be people who could be put in this situation, right? Like they have that prestige uh, about them, but also not only do they have the charisma to kind of continue to, uh, you know, play this role and enjoy it, but they play it off of each other well too. Uh, and I thought that was all pretty cool. Um, one thing I do want to mention because we got a great comment on the pre-show over at YouTube from TV Mania Two. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but anyone you can, if you want to read the whole comment, you can find that over on the YouTube comments at the, on the pre-show. Um, but I'm going to read selected bits here. So, uh, Hey, last year I binged all of your survivor podcasts and have been listening ever since I got caught up. And I want to just briefly editorially say, wow, that's, that's a lot of survivor podcasts. I'm, you know, thanks. I'm glad, but wow. Um, so, uh, he says, uh, I've really enjoyed your commentary of all the seasons and the insight both of you bring to the podcast. One thing that I would like to address though, as this new season begins is Boston Rob. While this toned down over the last few seasons, there was a point while I was binging where it seemed like you were talking about how amazing Boston Rob was in every episode. So I felt like now that we're entering a season in which he will be an integral part for the entire duration, it seemed like a good time to share my thoughts on Boston Rob. And I'm skimming a little bit here, but uh, the gist of it is saying, while I do think he's definitely a good player, he's not as great as you or a lot of other people have made him out to be. And uh, the gist of his argument, he kind of comes down to saying that, uh, uh, in his first season, he actually didn't play that well. He kind of came off a, a, as a, a dumb frat boy and didn't even make the jury. But uh, he and and he mentions that maybe part of our reaction is that we didn't watch that season. And that's fair. a fair point. I, I actually never did see his first season. Um, but... Uh, he talks about, uh, let's see. But everybody can have a bad um, rookie year and stuff. Well, yeah, but he's also saying when he was cast for All-Stars, it was more for his personality than for being a great player. And he did play a great game, but um, it was largely because he wasn't seen as a threat because of how poor his first season had been. And then yeah. while he did eventually play a dominant winning game on his fourth time, it was against all first-time players and Russell which, as you said uh, in this video regarding some recent seasons, really made things lopsided in his favor. And so when all is said and done, it took him four tries to win, and the fourth time was against a mostly I, I rookie cast. I consider that whichever the all-star won, I consider that a win for him. When Amber won? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean... Yes and no. Like on the one hand, I sure, don't. Yes I and know. no. Like he set it up so that they would that she would win. Like he made it that way. Like he yeah. knew that it was a win for both of them. Yeah. And she was the one who could win. That's true. I guess I'm. I just. Mm, yeah. Okay. I. I. Yeah. I follow what you mean. I wouldn't probably phrase it that way, but I do think it's. It is. Certainly. Um oversimplifying it to say he lost, right? You know, or that he didn't win. It's more complicated than that. But he also didn't win, right? So it's, it's yeah, but I agree, though. It's obviously that one's kind of complicated. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, so again, if anyone wants to see the rest of uh, TV Mania 2's comment, it's on the comments there. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there, and it's it's great. Definitely, thank you for that comment, even though mostly what you're telling us is that we're wrong, which is fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that what you and I both respond to, and you know, don't let me put words in your mouth unless they're words you agree with. Uh, what you and I respond to is that Rob, Boston Rob, even on the seasons where he didn't win, and, you know, we'll accept that first season because neither of us watched it, but he manages to make smart strategic moves where things turn out the way he wants them to and it feels like it's on purpose and when he talks about his strategy he sounds like he knows what he's talking about and that on top of him just being fun to watch in good tv generally right yeah. so that doesn't mean he's necessarily the end all be all strategic super genius mastermind but it means that when people talk in their profiles about knowing how to work people, a lot of people say that, but he's the one that seems like he actually can do it. Now, this is a game that has enough luck and random elements in it that you could be the all-time super genius mastermind and still not have a guaranteed win because sometimes it just works against you, you know, like the, the, the breaks. You know, how does the random tribe swap work? It might mess up all your plans, right? You know, you can't guarantee these things, but he's pretty good. And he seems like, you know, when he talks about strategy, he sounds like he knows what he's talking about. Yep, exactly. And I would say the other thing, I liked how they phrased their introductions where they, they mentioned that, you know, both had won the game and both had lost the game, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. No, I, as far I, as them being advisors, you know, I think that there's there is value in having made mistakes and learned from them, or played your best and still lost. Mm -hmm. You know, even though you did what you felt was right the whole time, but like you said, the breaks came. I think they have good experience that when you're kind of looking at them in hindsight, like Rob's body of work makes him one of the best survivor players that ever was there. Like, yeah. you know, regardless of his specific record you know of being one in four you know that that's a we that's a that's too fine of a point to look at it which is, i think is what you've been saying yeah yeah i well you know the other thing that is also true that i think we can probably both agree on is that everybody kind of has their favorites just based on intangibles right you know just you know i like this person or i don't like that person so much and you know it's like you know, if, if, if he's not your favorite, then you're naturally not as inclined to be as charitable in your descriptions. That's fine. Everybody has their favorite. Um, but yeah, I think I agree though, that they emphasize in this episode, you know, with him being like this, this, this idol as a mentor, they, they emphasize not only just, you're not always successful, but how do you learn from mistakes? Yep. And that's important. Right? Yeah. So, uh, so let's talk about uh, the episode, I guess. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we start right off the bat with Sandra and Boston Rob, and we get a brief intro to the two of them uh, for anyone, I guess, who's new enough to the game that they don't really know who they are. Um, I thought it was a little bit strange there, there's in the editing, of course, the, of co over the course of the episode, it seemed weird to me that scene by scene, there was a lot of imbalance between how much Sandra and how much Boston Rob, but it would like go back and forth. Like this opening section felt like it talked way more about Sandra than about Boston Rob, but then later it was more Boston Rob. Right. right. And it seemed like it would veer back and forth rather than trying to keep it kind of even consistently, which I thought was interesting. Um, I mean, maybe it's not that interesting, really. I just noticed. <laughs> right. No, I, yeah. I, I didn't really get the same feeling on it. I mean, you're right now that you say it, but I don't, I didn't get it the same that you're talking about. Yeah. 
Um, so we learned that, you know, the players are going to have the opportunity to win advantages in addition to advice. Uh, but then we move to our contestants and the first one we get to sort of meet directly is Karishma who talks about, uh, being so excited to be on the show, but having to keep it together and remain calm and not just let her enthusiasm blow everything you know, out of proportion or make her be seen as flighty or whatever. So she's just, you know, keeping it together as a contest competitor. I, I liked her. I thought she was charming. I thought she, you know, that editors must have thought so too, to have her open the episode like that. Yep. Um, so what do you think about having the uh, two tribes each kind of get their stranding without the formal sort of uh, marooning sequence and no probst? It was fine for me. I know they made like a big deal out of it and it's been made a big deal in like analysis of like what happened to Jeff Probst. Like it, it was fine. I mean, they know at this point, everybody knows what they're doing. Like mm -hmm. it, I, I, I didn't, I thought it was more of a, it, just a silly, like, I mean, it was fine. It, I didn't, <laughs> care about it. It, I thought they made a bigger deal out of it than it was. Um, it didn't make me enjoy or enjoy less it was fun. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure I thought anyone was enjoying it less, but it's more just a matter of it was a departure from standard procedure, although it has happened before. Uh, but uh, they, uh, in a interview, uh, Probe says that part of what was going on there was they were trying to emphasize the whole island of the idols thing by having that be the only real clue they have about anything early on and they were wanting to have them kind of start building like the paranoia about that um which i don't know is in sort of an interesting choice but in a lot of res a lot of ways i think it's again just part of how the show just tries to keep it fresh by doing things a little different every time yeah yeah uh, so we start with the Lyro tribe wearing the orange buffs and, uh, you know, everybody is certainly aware that, you know, it's going to take us a couple of episodes before we really feel like we know who everybody is, but, um, we, we get the sexy wood gathering sequence. There's a lot of rapid fire introduction montages where we get like a sentence worth out of most people, but it's pretty rapid fire. Um, uh, we, we meet Elizabeth, who was a favorite of yours during the pre-show, and uh, she's just right off the bat, doesn't, just not trying to hide that she's an Olympian. She's very yep. out front about it, brings it up even, which, you know, hey, good for her, but it's just an example of something that sometimes people try to hide that sort of thing. Right? Yep. Um, and then we get something that, you know, if it was in her profile at all, I missed it. But Missy talks about having had uh, a brain tumor that, you know, I guess she didn't exactly say it like this, but it was kind of implied that she had been in the military, but maybe had to be discharged because a medical discharge for that. It, I don't think she said that directly. Yeah. But, uh, but in any event, um, she, she was almost died from it, but it's now gone. And she just, I... I thought she was really cool. She had very, a very chill vibe to her. You know what I mean? Like she just was, you know, there was uh, like an intelligence there, but, but also that she's just cool. Right. I liked her, you know, and it just uh, like that, having that, you know, story is, you know, it's emotional. I, you know, I was engaged. I was drawn in. Um, and I also like that she later starts to uh, form an all lady alliance. I, I like that too. Um, but that was a little bit later because first we also have to meet the other tribe who are Vokai in the purple buffs. Um, I have a note here that just says Lauren is very excited. <laughs> Um, we, uh, get the little intro montages from them too. Uh, oh, and this is where we get Janet who immediately talks about how she knows she's, 
she's the old lady of the tribe and she has to be proactive to avoid being a stereotype or, you know, uh, thought of as a stereotype. And so the, the super mom, I'm doing finger quotes because that's what she said, uh, called herself was, uh, starts about setting fire without Flint, even before they've built a shelter and she does it great. Good for her. That's pretty awesome. Actually. Yeah. I like that about her. I thought that was pretty awesome. I also like that she, you know, we were concerned that she was going to be kind of stubborn and grumpy uh-huh. and she ended up being really gregarious and friendly. And so yeah. her, her quote about like my, oh, sorry, about <laughs> the thing. let me just see what that is. Sorry. Right. No problem. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so when we first saw her and she first started to speak up, I almost kind of proactively flinched because we were worried that that might be the case, that she was going to be kind of bossy. And so when she starts out saying like, oh, well, you know, we have to decide who's going to do what. Does anyone want to volunteer? But then we kind of realized that it's really that's all sort of preamble to her volunteering to try to make a fire so she can show off that she knows how to make a fire, even though they don't have Flint. And so that was pretty cool. Um, I, she's kind of a, a badass, but also very friendly and really didn't seem bossy at all. And in fact, she was really more like I'm trying to think she's, I want to, I was trying to think like supplicating, but I don't want it to be like, I don't want it to have any negative connotation there, but it was more like instead of coming to them from this perspective of authority, she's coming at them from a perspective of, I suspect you guys might underestimate me. So I want to show you that I'm valuable to you, but you know, it's almost anti bossy in that respect. So, uh, Mike, if you're listening in audio, Mike has not returned yet, so I'm not 100% sure uh, how long he's going to uh, be, but or if he's heard any of the things that I have said so far. These things happen with live streaming. Uh, I heard a sound. Uh, there was nobody there, so. Oh, well. A dog growled at nothing? What? No, I heard the doorbell. Maybe it was my neighbors that I could hear from. I could no, I don't know. But uh-huh. anyway, where are we off to? I don't know. Did you hear any of that stuff that I said when you were uh, checking the doorbell? I mean, not a ton. And my door, my door is four stories below me. All right. Well, what I just uh, the gist of it was basically just that uh, I, I kind of we both had anticipated that it was possible she might be bossy, but in the end, she was really almost like anti-bossy. She really came to them almost more like a you know, I want to make sure you guys don't underestimate me. So I'm going to prove myself to you, but that's, you know, that's coming to them from a perspective of, I want to show you how valuable I am to you as opposed to I'm telling you guys what to do for me. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that's mostly the only interesting bot bit we got from that early Vokai uh, bit. But uh, uh, at at Lyro, we we meet Vince, who talks a little bit about being the first uh, Hmong to be on Survivor. Is I, and I I feel like that's the way he phrased it, as opposed to like Hmong person or like person of Hmong ancestry. I'm just not. It seems like the it's probably not that important. Well, okay. We don't have to make a big deal about the way we phrase it is my point. Um, but, uh, that's what he, you know, uh, mentions. And that's, that's interesting. Cause, um, I didn't know very much about this either, but, uh, having found out a little bit more, uh, one of the interesting things about the Hmong culture is just that they don't actually have like a nation of origin. They're like a culture that spans several different nations, but in a geographical area, but they have their own sort of distinct culture nonetheless. Got it. Um, but anyway, he's cool. I like Vince. Um, he's, you know, he's just kind of funny and, you know, he's got a, you know, he's in touch with his emotions in a way that I enjoy, but also is willing to work. 
Um, he and Elaine both impressed Tom, the NHL player, with their work ethic and skills, and the three of them kind of click pretty quickly, uh, almost to the point where, well, not even almost, but to the point where everyone else kind of says, hmm, what's going on over there? Those three are awfully chummy. Maybe the rest of the seven us of us should unite against them. Yep. <laughs> Which, you know, it happens. Everybody on, you know, in the day one, that's, that's what everybody's doing, right? Is they're searching yeah. for what they can. Oh, sorry, you're breaking up on me a little bit. You there? Uh, my video is uh, showing you yeah, I'm here. out of sync oh. right now, though. Like the the video I'm seeing is not in sync with your audio. <laughs> mm. <Not> bad. <laughs> well, it's yeah, pretty bad. Yeah. So, uh, well, I mean, we can hear you okay. So, I suppose uh, hopefully the video will catch up. Um, but uh, yeah. So in the meantime, I'm so. I'm trying to see. If yeah, I think your your audio, even though it comes through clear, it's kind of on a lag. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know how to help that. I've turned everything off, else off Wi-Fi. Uh, all right. Well, so, so do we want to try? Is just it closer briefly? now? No. <laughs> um. Let's briefly um. You maybe try uh, hanging up out of the call, and I'll restart it. Uh, I can do that without interrupting the stream. So, yes, uh, sorry, everybody. I will brief uh, intermission here. Um, these things happen when you rely on the Internet technology for your uh, production workflow. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have Mike back in just a moment. And we'll see. So, um... But yeah, like as as I was just saying, certainly it's a common practice when dealing with. Uh, oh, there we are, back. Yep. Okay. So. <laughs> just clean some things. <laughs> yeah. Still seemed like you're maybe a teeny bit out of sync, but less. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I don't know. How to, yeah, well, okay. I've, I've <laughs> no. closed all my windows. I've, yeah, I've okay. disconnected my other devices from the Wi-Fi. That's just going to be what it's going to be, I guess. Yeah, well, it looks pretty close right now. Hopefully it'll it'll keep. Uh, but so in any event, um, your thoughts about Vince, Tom, and Lane forming a three and everyone else talking about them? I mean, they made it feel like a bigger deal than it actually ended up being. I mean, they're friendly with each other, and they remain that way, but mm -hmm. it obviously they didn't end up being ostracized. But like you said, it's day one. Mm -hmm. People are grasping for anything to align with, you right. know. It's, it's a more natural version of that one, like the one hyper weird one where they were, the guy was like, hey, there's six of us on the beach. Let's um, be the one yeah. pick. Which is even the one I want to yeah. say Vince or something. Like, no, I don't think uh, that was that. I think it might have been Coach, no. actually. I don't think it was Coach that said that. It was he, It was the guy who was like a bar owner or something. I feel like I can see him, his face in my head, but I don't remember. Either way, that, that's like yeah. the, the hyper example of, of what you do on day one anyway. Like, people yeah. are like looking for, well, who do I bond with? Who can be ostracized? And that's why when you go over to the other tribe, like how stupid it was for Jason yeah. to be running around looking for an idol, not on an island, on the island of idols, mm -hmm. first of all. Like, and, and on day one, like when people are specifically looking for something like that, mm -hmm. you know, to just choose you, regardless of all your other personalities. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know um, it it, it's really interesting. Um, we'll we'll be talking more about Elizabeth on the island later, but I think there's some interesting parallels when we're talking about day one and new players. This idea that everyone 
or at least a lot of them are in a hurry to do survivor things. Your doorbell again? Yes. Okay. We'll uh, you uh. Keep, just keep moving along and I'll yeah. catch up wherever you are. <laughs> God. All right. So uh, in any event, um, the parallels are interesting, I think, where we have new players who are in a hurry to do survivor things. They are on an adventure. They're excited to get started. They want to do all of the things they watched people do on TV. And so I think that's what was going on there with Jason is that he is excited because he has seen, like we all have that we've been watching Survivor for a while, we've seen people go out and do idol hunting before anyone else and they find one. And isn't it great? Then they have an idol and they're safe and it's exciting and they've done something on a TV show and it's exciting and they're just excited. And I think that leads them to impatience where they're not willing to take the time and read the situation and make their moves at the right time. Now, it's certainly true in a game like this that it's possible to wait too long. That's happened also. But, you know, that's ultimately part of the lesson that we will get to when we talk more about the Island of the Idols. And I think it's also a part of what both Sandra and Boston Rob did when they did play the game well. Part of what they were able to do was to be patient and not feel like they need to immediately act on any impulse that comes. So that's kind of a, a, a tricky thing to deal with. But so we had at Vokai, we had most of the camp chilling. And uh, so pe everyone notices when uh, Jason starts looking for idols which, you know, is mostly just down to the impatience of a new player. Yep. Um, but uh, Dan is the one who, who not only notices he's gone, but immediately starts thinking, oh, this is a perfect opportunity <laughs> to focus everybody around a target and suddenly ease everybody's anxiety about who's going to be the first one to go. Well, it's going to be him. He made himself a target. That's the plan. Everybody gets to feel good about it, you know, and uh, and that's not necessarily a bad plan, although, you you know, it seems like he managed to pull it off in a pretty subtle way as opposed to it being obvious that he's the one spreading that. It's obvious to us because we see him hatching the plan and then enacting it, but... Uh, you know, not making it a big deal because otherwise you get your own power player label. Um, but this is where Dan, who is the talent agent, talks about how working with actors is like playing Survivor, where you're dealing with a lot of big personalities, passionate people who are aggressive about what they want and uh, needing to be able to talk them into not only the decisions you think that are, will be the best for them, but also the decisions you think will be best for you. And I, you know, it's like, yeah, okay, I can see that. Frankly, I, I see that as more applicable than being a poker pra player, frankly, which, you know, I mean, <laughs> we'll talk about Ronnie a little bit later. Uh, yes. Um, but yeah, so uh, it's interesting to see him be very self-aware and deliberate about deciding, well, Jason has given me an opportunity to create a built, uh, first vote narrative, and so I'm going to do it. I thought that was interesting. Uh, then we get, we get some of uh, Jack, who's the youngest, who's kind of a playful type. Uh, he catches a great big clam. He hopes that his playful attitude will be an asset and we get some silliness with the clam spraying water at people. Um, and then let's see, we also meet Tommy who seems like um, he's also doing pretty well in terms of like connecting with a number of people. We see him talking to Jack. 
we see him talking to another one of the women who I can't remember. I didn't write in my notes who it was, but he talks about um, having, uh, you know, dated his girlfriend for a long time and now he's going to propose to her and he kind of gets choked up a little bit about it and that's very sweet. Um, we have Molly talking about being happy to kind of you know, she's essentially ha having exactly the reaction Dan was hoping for, which is to say, who isn't it a relief that we already know who's going to be the first to go and it won't be me. I'm in a group that has made a decision that is not me not voting me out, <laughs> which I don't mean to downplay uh, Molly there, but uh, it's just interesting that, you know, she she what we see from her is her expressing exactly the opinion, the feeling that uh, Dan was hoping for. Uh, Jamal also, you know, kind of expresses that too. Uh, but Nora is, Nora spelled N-O-U-R-A, um, likes Jason or is just uh, maybe a little bit contrarian by nature, which is kind of a, a gut feeling I have about her, um, decides that she's going to go warn Jason. Um, you do realize everybody... <laughs> saw you missing and now they're talking about voting you out and uh jason is understandably and rightfully spooked about all that he he is worried rightfully so that he has blown up his whole game already correct yeah um he ultimately kind of just lucked out that the tribe didn't uh you know didn't lose it, that first immunity challenge um but yeah so that's kind of where we get through them for a while but then we also get uh elaine uh back over at the uh at the lyro tribe this is where we first kind of meet elaine and she talks a little bit about her sense of humor and how she's kind of always used you know make make them laugh with you so they don't laugh at you that sort of you know humor as a defense mechanism that i think a lot of people can relate to but we also see that she's really got a very nice easy charm to her she's not um abrasive at all like you know sometimes you know just looking at the profile it's hard to tell uh, and i think we wondered if she might be but she really doesn't come across that way at all she seems very easy to like which is of course what everybody else reacts to uh, about her yeah exactly and you know she talked a little bit about the background behind that you know because she was made fun of a lot when she was mm -hmm. younger and used humor as like a, a way to fit in with people. And I mean, she's, she is funny and she is really charming and she does. And it seems genuine yeah. now, like it may have started that way, but it seems to be a, a real, mm -hmm. an actual funniness, not a mask as much anymore. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Absolutely. Which is good because otherwise when she makes it far enough, like if that was a mask and gets stripped off, like it could be pretty ugly, but well, you know, and, it, and I think she'd still be funny under stress. Yeah. yeah. Well, and what we see from her later, too, is that she comes across as sincere even when being funny. And it seems genuine because we can see her, like, when she turns and starts talking about being emotional, like thinking she's going to go home, talking about her background, like, you can, you can see all of those emotions processing. It all feels very sincere and genuine. And, you know, like, that's a big part of the, that stark contrast between her and Ronnie, which I don't know that the performance at Tribal Council is what made everybody's decision, but it was pretty stark. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the differences between them, um, even as Ronnie was specifically trying to draw parallels, he kind of ended up just, say, drawing the line between the two of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, in the meantime, though, here's where we have Missy talking about putting together a women's alliance. Uh, obviously, it's a l I don't want to say premature, but because they have five versus five, it's not enough by itself yet. But, you know, for them to be planning ahead and that, you know, the idea being we don't want it to be a woman to go first and then it can be something, right? Right. So if they can kind of keep it under wraps until they make a man go home first, then they have some power. 
but she is Missy is already a little bit worried because of course she has heard the others talking about like this whole Elaine Vince Tom thing. Uh, so this is where we get to day two and we have the whole sequence with uh, Dan being kind of a uh, handsy, uh, a little, uh, he's, he's a touchy feely guy, which I was kind of amazed at this whole sequence because of how it could have turned into something else, but people acted like responsible grownups with emotional intelligence and they dealt with the problem. And at least in the immediate term, it seems resolved. That's yeah. kind of cool because, you know, he seemed sort of like he's a touchy feely sort of guy. Not everybody likes that. And he was maybe not as aware as would be ideal of whether people were more or less receptive to that. Um, but you know, a couple of the women kind of sort of compared notes and were in agreement of like, yeah, yeah, yeah it's making me a little uncomfortable too. But you know, they just decided to, um, you know, Kelly decided to in a very non-aggressive way to basically just talk to him about it and say, you know, listen, I totally understand. You're not trying to make me feel uncomfortable. You're not trying to do anything negative. You're just expressing, you know, affection and friendship in the way that makes sense to you. But here's what I would prefer. And so here's how we can communicate and not <laughs> accidentally press each other's buttons in that way. And so, um, I, it will, it remains to be seen like how, if, if things develop at all, but it, I kind of liked that it didn't just become a, we're all mad at Dan now and you know, he's a jerk and we're going to have a screaming fight and make it a whole big thing. Um, I, I liked that they were all able to handle it kind of like grownups. Yeah. I thought it was awesome. Yeah. The I found it odd, though, that, you know, being somebody who's so involved in Hollywood, like, that he wouldn't be more in tune to, not that he was doing anything, like, he definitely wasn't over the line. Mm -hmm. I, you would think he would be extra careful. Yeah, I I think, he, yeah, he he wasn't over the line, but there there were definitely a couple of times where he sort of, he, he asked after touching, not before, that sort of thing. Right, and that was what my thing is, like, wouldn't you think that you'd be had, had sort of moved the other way? I mean, but yeah. I guess uh, well, uh, if you're not, you don't have the self-awareness that that's bothering people or no one's ever said anything to you, yeah. then, you well, know, then what, how would you know that you're, you, cause you could look at it and say, well, yeah, I mean, I'm just being friendly. Like that's not anything like, right. and again, it's not like the me too stuff. It's not an even, I don't want to put it in that category. I'm just saying because he's involved in, in an area where that is so prevalent, I would feel like he would be more sensitive to, yeah. And, and, people feelings with that and and be carefuler but right yeah. well and the thing is too that like part of what makes it not like the me too stuff is that he does seem to agree to stop when they talk to him about it right you know it's, it's, that works you know, 100 yeah <laughs> yeah because uh like one of the you know the fears anytime someone is thinking about having that sort of conversation is that he's just going to turn into an asshole about it and say well you know look i'm just be trying to be nice if you don't like it then you're just a bitch that sort of thing that's the reaction people worry about yeah you know, i mean i was worried about that happening when she when she decided to go talk to him yeah you know and so yeah. thankfully yeah, kudos to him for, yeah. for being an, also right. an adult about right. it, you know. And and, and I think it's it's worth noting, too, that, like, uh, in this little brief Dalton Ross interview, Probst does just hasten to add, it's like, producers and cameramen are standing by, and if, ever, if anyone ever really crossed a line, they would absolutely step in. And he was just saying that, like, he's also glad they were able to sort of resolve it amongst themselves in, in the, in this sort of positive communication way. But he also just adds like, they're very concerned about safety of their players. They just want to, you know, so they would step in if they ever felt like someone was really crossing a line. Yeah. But I, it was great that, uh, you know, you know, hopefully he can take that lesson, <laughs> you know, be a little bit more thoughtful in advance of uh, 
of the future thing. And I mean, like, see, like, you know, we saw him giving the massage to Janet and she seemed into it. So, you know, yeah, great. You know, and that's all, all that stuff is fine. Assuming everybody is agreeing that it's fine. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I realized after the fact that I think my only note about Dean at all, despite us really liking him in the pre-show, was that Elaine joked about him being really skinny. Like, we could yeah. see his spine already, and I think that was my only note about him in the whole episode. But, you know... Uh, he came up a couple of times later. Well, he, 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 ha yeah. he tried to do the grapple throw in the challenge and couldn't do it and swapped out with someone. Um, but I didn't, like specifically take a note about it um i mean you know he was definitely part of the decision to move off of a lane and over like he was in that whatever that group was yeah I do yeah that. yeah um, that's i mean like he was obviously present i'm just saying in terms of the episode didn't really spend any time with him mm -hmm. unless he was just pr part of a group but Correct. you know that's that's to be expected in in a show like this where we're trying to meet twenty people in a ninety minute TV episode, right? You know, you can't. Not everybody gets a lot of screen time, and so that's pretty common. Is that you know we meet a couple of big personalities up front, and then we'll gradually get ever to know everyone else more later. Um. But yeah, so Ron, this is where we have Ronnie talking about watching people and saying how he likes Elaine, but he's already seeing how easily she has just formed these, you know, friendships with, with everybody. And he's just saying, yep, she could be a threat. And uh, so he decides to go try to have this conversation with her to get good vibes with her. So she feels safe, but he really wants to target her. And it's kind of... I felt it kind of fun to have her just immediately see through all of that. Yes. I mean, the sequence was like, okay, I feel terrible for everything I said about maybe poker playing like translates because he didn't observe anything that anyone else didn't observe. Mm -hmm. He made a big deal about how he was sitting back to observe that Elaine was friendly with everyone. Like everyone knew that. Mm -hmm. Like, that wasn't a secret. That's not like some secret observation. And then his like bluff was so terrible that she was just like, yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Well, you know, the thing is, it doesn't make you wrong about poker in general, but perhaps it mean we, it, it does raise the question perhaps of it lists his career as a poker player. Is he good? Yeah. Um, he, he certainly lists a lot of other jobs later. Um, so true. it's not necessarily obvious that he is. But, but then again, you know, poker is obviously a lot of things that is not always the same thing as Survivor. Yeah. And so I think there are probably are overlapping skills, but he certainly did not seem to do a great job in, in this particular regard. Especially because as they discuss a little later in the Tribal Council... Someone being super likable who's a threat at the end of the game, sure, yeah, that's good to pay attention to, but that's not who you vote for day one. Right. Why would you do that? <laughs> that's, it just, it's, it really, it's, it's again, it's like Jason in such a hurry to do a survivor thing by going out and, uh, you know, looking for an idol day one, and even though it doesn't actually make sense to do that yet. And so by the same token, Ronnie is saying, oh, get out the likable person so they don't get to the end and win. That's a survivor thing. I want to do that. And But, you know, it's it's a little early to try to be focused at, on this, like you're building your resume. You know, it's it's really even just, yeah, it's too early. He's impatient which is just a running theme throughout the episode, which I think is pretty cool, actually. Um, 
So she, I, I, I definitely like, uh, you know, Elaine continues to be charming, though, when she's basically saying, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, I smiled and nodded, but boy, I can tell that what he was really up to. And so, you know, hey, if that's what he wants, then dual time, guns drawn. Um, although, I mean, you know, even though it ends up going for Ronnie, I mean, I... I wonder, we'll have to, we'll talk more about how that developed uh, as we get there. So maybe we don't have to jump ahead to it. Uh, so we have the challenge. Um, everyone, um, you know, uh, there's a little bit of talk about feeding into this idea of what they think Island of the Idols means. I liked the challenge though, you know, just, I like it whenever they have sort of a big little construction prop thing you know with, where it's colorful and i mean that's like a silly thing to smile at but i smile every time they do it when they just have look it's a big orange platform and a big purple platform it's like it matches their buffs it makes yeah. me smile when they do that it looks better that's, than when they just have plain wood that's why they do it yeah um so they have you know they have to um crawl up the rope net and they go down the slide and then through the sawdust pile um and then you know, grapple throw and then climb up the rope thing and then the big uh, cool village puzzle, the 3D village with all the little huts was pretty cool. Um, I thought it was the, the immunity idol with the two faces on it. Like, it's, it's weird because it looks weird and we get it because we understand what the actual theme is. But I can only imagine what everybody else is looking at that. It's like, what? What a weird looking <laughs> tribe immunity challenge. Don't, you know, idol. It's, it's yeah. strange. Anyway, it's fine. Um, it's, we get Vokai taking an early lead through a lot of the, the obstacles. Uh, and then Janet follows up her fire making by uh, managing to hook the grapple with her first try, it looked like. Um, yeah. So good for her. Not only that she, you know, put herself out front to try it, but then also delivered twice. That's, I, <laughs> she's doing pretty great in my opinion right now. Yeah, I, I, I like her a lot more than I expected to. Same, same. Um, and so... Uh, Ronnie does, uh, get the grapple for Lyro. Um, Lyro makes up the entire deficit by having far superior teamwork on climbing up the, like the rope climb thing, partly because it seemed like, uh, Vokai in the purple buffs, like they would get one person up and then that person like tossed down the ropes, but then just stood there while, while everyone down at the bottom had to make a whole new ladder. And it was just like, whereas you look over at the other tribe, it's like, no, they made a ladder and then they have like the whole team of people, <laughs> you know, climb, climbing up of it and doing like a whole thing where they're all actually helping each other get up. And, yep. it, and it was a little bit belated that Vokai realized, oh yeah, we should probably do that. Um, but despite... Starting later, uh, Vokai is just dominant with the puzzle. Um, it was not clear what Lyro did wrong, but they, they got to a point where the, the piece that should fit didn't fit, and they came to the conclusion they must have done some other piece wrong. It doesn't look like they ever really solved whatever the issue was. Um, it looked like they almost like broke it or something. Like Yeah, I don't know. It's unclear. It does seem... Like, yeah, some, I mean, presumably if something was actually broken, that seems like the sort of thing that they might adjudicate. You know what I mean? But yeah, I agree. And just, that's what it felt like. Whatever they had right. done made it feel like they had broken a, like a piece and it was like stuck or something. Cause they like could not figure out how to get mm -hmm. them to like mesh, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I don't know what happened there, but, uh. It, you know, but they lost despite having gotten to start the puzzle first. Um, so I, I have a note here that gives Jason some time to maybe make up for his early mistake. Yep. Um, so 
they uh the winning tribe uh goes back to their beach with the idol uh and then only the losing tribe gets told about island of the idols and that one person is going to go what do you think about the idea of having it be randomly determined instead of someone getting picked like by the other tribe or by that tribe or volunteers or whatever uh i i like it for this one yeah yeah i <sighs> It's it's just such a weird advantage. Like you know, I, I don't. I just feel like it's hard, too hard to decide, and it, and it in, introduces like an element of the game that's just not necessary with what all the other things they have going on right now. Of having to like figure it out because it is such a such a benefit. I mean, they've done it where it's almost more of a positive than it is like a negative. Like some of the, some of these like exclusion things, like they're kind of both, but they're not, you know, they don't go for that long. So it's not like, it's not like exile where maybe you can find an idol, but you also have to live by yourself and like torment mm -hmm. for three days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just, you don't want to have it where they just keep sending the same person back, mm -hmm. you know, like, Oh, you get somebody who's like trustworthy on your Alliance. So you just keep sending them, mm -hmm. and then that way no one else ever gets a chance. Oh. The information, the information, the information. Bring you back the information. Let you know if they won. You know, this allows the chance that an underdog could get over there, that someone who really needs a break could get over there. Like, I, I think for what it is, this, this makes the most sense for me. I, I, I was okay with it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Like, I mean, that work, it works okay, but I can't help but feel like it is just sacrificing an opportunity for a drama, right? Like it is, it is just make something random when I they could make it a thing. You know, and like if they wanted to mix it up a little bit, they could have it where like it always has to alternate back and forth between tribes. Like each tribe always or the, has to pick never someone go, from the other one. You can never go twice in a row. Yeah, yeah, or something like that. And you can't send the same person twice in a row. Yeah. Yeah. Like I feel I think like. It'll be fine. I yeah, think it'll well, be fine. I think yeah. it'll be fine. It just, it seems like it feels at worst to me like a missed opportunity. But. I feel like they're they're rolling the dice the other way and that this introduces a better chance that somebody who really needs this and is an underdog has an ability has a has a shot at it. Mm -hmm. Like if this turns out to be like such an advantage and like you all cuz if you always have a shot at an idol and some good information and practical skills, like if it always works the way that it did, well, like that's a pretty significant advantage. Well, let me make the case in the other direction though is that chance at an idol but you have to beat Boston Rob at fire making? That's not That's much of a chance. One, I know, yeah. but the point is that it... Well, we don't know what the rest of them, the producers right. may know that there's much I know. more odd. Later. I know, yeah. but I'm saying if the others are at all equivalent to this one, they may they may not be, but for all we know they are. Um, it, so it sounds like Sandra and Boston Rob have some uh, degree of empowerment to kind of decide whether how good or bad to make the deal. Yes. Um, and so they're going to be trying to, you know, bargain down, like they're going to try to haggle these deals down. Um, but it's also the thing we have to remember is it's not like sometimes in the past where, again, you know, it's one thing to be gone for three days, but generally you're gone and immune from whatever that tribal council was because you're going to be gone for it but in this one she has to be gone during half of that crucial strategy session of everybody deciding who's going to go and then still have to go back and be vulnerable right after you have gotten a target on your back by maybe finding an idol and being deprived of the opportunity to have those strategy talks which I'm not saying there's not an upside. I'm saying there's also a downside. Right, but that's what makes it entertaining. And But you would still, if you were the tribe in the majority, like you would send somebody you trusted there versus an underdog. This gives the opportunity for some high drama and that an underdog could go there, could 
negotiate correctly with them to get into a challenge that they could win. Because Boston Rob was willing to go the other way in this one. He wasn't trying to haggle down. He said he came in with his lowest offer. Mm-hmm. Like she basically could have said, like, I need a certain amount of head start or I want yeah. an eye in it. Like well, but and the-, the, the drama of an underdog going in there, beating Boston Rob at something, like they have now equipped themselves for the off chance that, that happens at the expense of not having a you know, them have to have a debate after the tribal council. That's why I think it's okay. But the concern you're talking about is easily remedied by just having each tribe, like one tribe has to pick someone from the next tribe or even whoever goes this first time has to pick someone from the other tribe for the next one. Right? Like it's just not random. Like they had her pick from the bag, but they had her pick randomly from the bag instead of just choosing someone. So I I don't know. I mean, it's like I said, I'm not saying it's terrible. I'm just saying it's it felt to me like yeah, they, you could get drama out of it, but we won't because it's random. Right. And yeah, and I guess your thought of the person there picks the person from the other tribe by choice, like that yeah. that feels better than the normal like we get together and we decide who goes. Right. Um, or even yeah, we get together cool. like or what if the winning tribe you get immunity and you get to pick someone from the losing tribe to go. Right. Cause then you would likely pick an underdog to give them an opportunity. Yeah. If you wanted them to break up something or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The only, yeah. The only time that would come kind of, well, no, cause they even still it, just when they go to individual immunities, it would get odd, but well, I, guess you I mean, you can always anyway. to change things up at that point anyway. Yeah, I think that was a yeah, that was a good discussion. I can see your point a little bit better now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still okay with it, but I, I definitely see what you're saying more than I did when you know when you kind of first started. So mm-hmm. yeah. I I think I was really just fixated on, even though obviously she seemed like she was ultimately really happy for the experience. Being having to be away from your tribe knowing you're going to tribal council and missing a huge chunk of that crucial time, that is a huge downside to this. It, except it, I think it's more dramatic right now because it's the first one and she doesn't have any like real feeling of where everybody is. Mm-hmm. I think that'll be better as they go into it. Because as we saw in this one, like it almost it it ended up being an asset to her because everybody was so excited to like tell her what they wanted to do and like she became like this sounding board of like hey here's all our ideas and it, and and not that everybody's going to have that yeah. same effect only, only because that. she was someone who was already more or less safe though. Like, right, I understand that, but that's the part of why I think it's fun that it's random is that we don't like it's always going to be different so because she was safe she had different not always underdog is going to be like dramatically trying to figure out how to get out from underneath and and it's not any it's not always ever better when they're just back at tribal like if you're if you're the person who's unsafe like that afternoon is not always your make or break like i don't think it's going to be as big a deal as you think you make it but as, as you think it is but we'll see okay I, I mean, I think ultimately she has maybe learned a valuable lesson, but mostly what was accomplished is missing out on a lot of crucial strategy with people she doesn't know very well yet and lost her vote. I'm going to let you have the last word. All right. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I guess that seems, you know, just, you, you that way decided anyway. to let me have the last word in a very <laughs> passive aggressive way. Let's move I mean, on. I, just, I had more to say, but I feel like you're yeah, no, okay. have a lot for you. Well, I, so. think, I think we're not <laughs> convincing each other. I think we're actually arguing past each other anyway, so it's fine. Right. Um, so, uh, but we do have her go to the oh. island. and I'm um, filling my water. Okay. So the, uh, the, I still think the statues are goofy. Um, it's clear, you know, the more we get a look at them, that they're clearly very well made. They are well developed statues. Uh, my understanding is that they were based literally on 3D mapped computer models of their actual faces and then, you know, produced by 
people who make these sorts of things. And so they're very good, even if the conception of them is goofy. So it is an extremely well-made goofy statue. Yes. Um, uh, it's also weird to have the uh, have Boston Rob read the whole idol oath, oath of the idols thing after, even though that was already explained to us at the beginning of the episode. Yes. Um, so. But, all right. Um, I really loved that just the way that whole thing played out because on the one hand, you know, coach on how to build the fire. Okay. Yeah. That seems really interesting and valuable. Um, and it was weird and I was curious about it. Why is it that Rob does it himself very fast? And then Elizabeth goes off with Sandra without Rob to practice it herself. That and I was when that was happening, I was thinking, that's strange. Why is that? Why are they doing it like that? And then, of course, the answer, which is great, is we have Rob do it very fast first, so you know how good he is, and it's intimidating at the thought of trying to beat him. But then you get to practice, and then you go back to be surprised with this this possibility of a challenge. I thought that was very good pacing of that whole little setup. Uh, got you yep. broken up there there it looks like you're back yep i was just saying i liked it as well it was nothing more to add from what i've already said at the opener or in our last discussion so yeah. so um i really liked to first of all the idea that they have some degree of choice like they can choose to up the ante or whatever like to encourage and i loved the way they essentially manipulated her into taking the bait and then explains to her why the actual lesson here was not how to make fire. It was that you have to be smarter at not taking the bait with dumb choices like that. Yep. Because you saw how fast he was. You only just learned how to do it. How in the world did you think you were going to beat him? Right. But they played Which that part of the setup was so good, yeah. you know, like to have him just like go lightning quick, like, you know, you it, it's not a there's not an unknown of what you're up against. Like you literally watched it an hour ago. Yeah. And you think you're good enough now. Mm -hmm. Like, right. Oh, and, you're a competitor? Cool. Yeah. Well, you're competing to lose. <laughs> yeah. And they they but they kind of teased her into it. But making that the point. And it's like we were just saying, this whole running theme of people who are new players that are just so, you know, impatient. They want to do things. And she wants to be the person who takes the challenge and who doesn't give up and, you know, wants to have the adventure. And all of these things are understandable, reasonable human emotions to feel in that moment. But, you know, they're not wrong when they tell her, what were you thinking? Like what, you know, well, I mean, they know what they, she was thinking, but the point is you need to be smarter than that. Don't take, don't take bites out of challenges that you can't win. You know, you, you know your strengths and play to those rather than trying to compete at what everyone else is best at. Right. And this is where I, I kind of, at the beginning, why I think that they're, they're so good on this because mm -hmm. They really act like good teachers, you know. They didn't. They didn't make her feel stupid, right? Yeah. You know, like they still made her feel like she left with a valuable lesson, even after she got beat, mm -hmm. you know, by Boss and Rob. And and the lesson wasn't the fire, like you said. Mm -hmm. So I think they they just their their composure and their teaching was so good. And and what I was thinking about is like, like at first when Rob said like, oh, I mean, she took my first offer. Like, how stupid was that? Like, I was willing to to negotiate. Mm -hmm. And then what I realized is like, well, at first I was like, well, how would she know you were willing to negotiate? Like, that's not part of it. And then what I realized is if she had said no, he would have initiated yeah. Yeah. the negotiation and said, what if I give you a one minute head start or whatever? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, what if your string comes down a certain amount? Yeah. You know, like, yeah, like then, then, and then she would have realized, oh, this is a negotiation and said, 
I'd like a one minute. I mean, you've played a hundred hours or whatever. I'd like a one minute head start and my string down. What can I do that? Mm -hmm. You know, what if I compete with you straight up, but I only can win the idol and don't lose my vote, mm -hmm. but I'll still compete with you. You know, like yeah. there's so many things like that. And that would have been fun, but yes, they need somebody to say no to them. Right. And they'll start it. Cause at first I was like, that's a really cool idea, but how, who's going to be, who's going to understand they can negotiate. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh yeah. Right. Like Rob will do that because they're really good teachers, mm -hmm. you know? But their, their whole thing was emphasizing how easy it was for them to manipulate her understandable, reasonable passion and excitement for being in the game. And isn't it cool? It's a fire making challenge, just like on TV. And I am yep. an adventurous person who does lots of things and I'm good at lots of things. And I just learned how to make a fire. And this is Boston Rob egging me on. Isn't that cool? But he's right. also just pointing out like, but you have to be able to critically look at any of these opportunities. If you have an opportunity to make a move in the game or make a deal with someone, you have to be able to see when they're manipulating you. Right. Yeah. And I, I thought that was really cool. Exactly. And, and she learned less like this isn't because she part of her reasoning was like, I'm, I'm an Olympian. I'm never going to turn down a challenge. Like I'll jump in the pool with anybody. But that's that was a great point and that this competition is different and the rules are different and losing a challenge mm -hmm. could be losing a million dollars, but it's also not as cut and dry. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not as straightforward as like, let's both get in the pool and see who's faster. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many more things at play in the fact that like, I know I'm faster. I know I can beat you, but I can trick you into competing with me and losing. Like that's a whole aspect of this that doesn't exist in her normal competitive way. And it was, a, I, and I love that she was like, she was so wide eyed and like so open to learning it. Like she was a good person to have go on this one too. Yeah. yeah. Because of those things, you know, because she was safe because she, you know, was a competitor and had that whole like, and it drew that sort of sport parallel and showed how it was different. And because she was seriously open to learning from what they taught her um, outside of just the fire and walked yeah. back with like this new confidence of, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I'm definitely not going to fall for the first thing that comes my way. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, I, it, it's, it's <laughs> interesting, I think, to discuss perhaps whether she may have overcorrected or not, because the, the idea of not telling the truth about what the, what's on the island, I think I, I want to next talk about the pros and cons of that decision. Yeah, I have, I have pretty much one thought on that actually. Okay. And that is she can overcome it if she is honest back at camp immediately and says what goes on. That's, that's my feeling is like you come back or at least to your alliance or something mm -hmm. because it's going to come out. Yeah. So if you come back and you say, hey, by the way, guys, this isn't really what the Island of Idols is like. I had to say it because I didn't know what I was walking into here. Mm -hmm. So I've created a story because I just didn't know the lay of the land. Mm -hmm. But because we're all tight and I trust you, I'm going to give you the exactly what actually happened. Mm -hmm. And give them a, 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 maybe an annotated but true story of what happened there. I feel like that's her best play, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because it is, I think the, the dilemma and understanding her motivation in wanting to keep it secret is because we've certainly talked in the past about the idea of like, oh, you found an idol. Do you tell people or not? Right. What things do you keep secret versus what things do you not keep secret? And this is a perfect example of something where like you could keep secret on, on the idea that like, oh, well, knowledge is power, that sort of thing. But ultimately this is something where the value of the information is pretty limited really. Right. Because what does it gain to know what's really there over someone who doesn't know? Right. Because knowing who has an idol and who doesn't is key strategically because you don't want to throw votes away on someone who's going to play an idol. 
right? And so it matters a lot to know who has an idol compared to someone who doesn't know who has an idol, right? That's valuable information that's useful to keep as a secret or known only to a small number. But right. something and like this. Advantages as well, you know, like. Yeah. Like advantages in the game is right. the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so in this circumstance, it's one thing to say, keep secret that you lost your vote or that you got an advantage, like keep the final outcome secret, maybe, or lie about it. Like I could totally see that, but lying about the whole nature of the thing could just bite you later when people find out that you were dishonest about it. Be without- I 100% really agree. That's why I think the best course is to be as honest as soon as possible because you have, you have plausible reason for why you were dishonest like yeah. you literally just came back into a tribal council that you had no or not or a, or a tribe you had no idea mm -hmm. the lay of the land and everybody wants to know something that you know you're you're trying to expeditiously move to let's let's be done with this and talk because nothing actually happened there mm -hmm. and, and she probably doesn't have to still say even when she tells them that she didn't because it was weird like probes didn't read on camera her no vote mm -hmm. so but that's actually another piece to it is if they know there was a no vote right i wonder about I don't that. Know if he, yeah if he strategically didn't have that in there because they don't actually read it and now well, she doesn't have to explain it i think i don't they know would have only, yeah, yeah they would have only shown it if they had to for some reason but they wouldn't have ever had to because uh, I guess the only I, the only way they would have had to is um, if there was some question that it might be a five five tie, right? Right. So if they had five votes for one person and four votes for another, and everyone's saying, "Okay, what's the tenth vote?" That would be the only time they would actually have to show it, because as soon as you get to six, um, you know, votes for one person, you're you're done. You don't have to read the rest. Right, and I think you and I both believe that 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 they just stop there in the show. Also, like obviously they stop for the audience because it doesn't matter. Right, I no. believe they also stop in the show. But I, I, I yeah, yeah, I didn't know for sure if they also showed the remaining votes just for whatever. I feel like but, they must because otherwise the no vote would immediately have everybody saying what's going on with that. Right, like it would be immediately a big question. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, but in any event. Um, you know, just to just to close the book on the uh, Island of the Idols sequence, uh, you know, I will certainly uh, admit that they had me going like it's easy to see the lesson in hindsight. But even from the comfort of my couch in the moment, I wanted her to do it. I, Me too. Yeah. I said, Hell yeah. And I said for the same reason, like. You're a damn Olympian, like, go for it. Like, what do you got to lose yeah. other than your vote and you're safe? Like, look, go do it, you know? See yeah, what you got. Like, there's something fun, like, even if you're sure you're going to lose, there's there's a fun quality to the idea of, well, if you're going to lose, lose to the best, right? Lose to someone who's really good. Yeah, and imagine how awesome it will feel if I win and get an immunity idol. Yeah, how, would, yeah. how cool would that be? And, it may, and like he said, you know, maybe it doesn't matter that much. If my alliance is good, maybe... Maybe my vote doesn't really matter that much. Maybe that's okay. And, you know, it's it's just like all of that. But again, you know, it, it, that's, I think, what made the lesson so valuable is just the turn right after that happens of just saying, think about what just happened here. Because you liked the idea, the fun of it. You were dazzled by Boston Rob's smile. You just gave up your vote trying to win something that you really had almost zero chance of winning. So that's actually what raises the question of like, what's going to happen with future challenges, right? Like, cause he's really good at making fire, but are, they're not going to do fire making every week. Right. Presumably. I mean, so, that would be an odd. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that's not what they're doing every week, but if that's not what they're doing, what are they going to do? Because well, this one seems week. like a slam dunk. They might not all be so obvious. Maybe it'll be a different lesson every week. We'll see. Um, but in the meantime, mm -hmm. um, uh, we have 
back at Lyra, we have everyone sort of commiserating about the puzzle failure. Um, we definitely had lots of people sort of willing to take on the emotional labor of saying, yes, somehow. I think it was actually Elaine who was kind of trying to like, you know, tell the, make the people who failed at the puzzle feel better by like, well, we were putting a lot of pressure on you, which is a nice thing to say. She's a nice person, but it's also like, yeah, but, <laughs> you know, they still had to do it. You know, you're trying to not make them feel bad, I guess, but it's also at a certain point still their responsibility. Um, in any event, we have, Vince, Elaine, Chelsea, and Tom talking about wanting to go against Ronnie. But Vince at this point is sort of the wild card because he's the one at this point who's thinking, I don't think we have enough numbers for it to be sure that it's going to go our way. And I think I might be the one they're planning to target. So he goes over to, uh, you know, talk to some of the others, like uh, we've got Karishma and Ronnie and Missy and Aaron, um, who I had initially in my notes as Tattoo Guy until I eventually, you know, caught his uh, name and, and went back. Also Guy constantly brushing his teeth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he did do that a lot, didn't he? Yeah, he always was like, yeah, had the yeah. toothpick up there. Mm-hmm. Um, so they talk about, uh, at least to Vince, they talk about the idea of bringing him in and targeting Elaine, but, you know, admit to the camera later that they're actually still trying to decide between Vince and Elaine, but of course they would tell Vince that it's Elaine. Um, and then we have Karishma torn because on the one hand she can sort of, you know, see the argument about Elaine being a threat. But she doesn't want to go against the female alliance. And I think ultimately that, you know, I think that might be part of what, you know, where the decision comes down ultimately is that this idea that Elaine is this big threat is like everyone can maybe see like, yeah, she's this super likable person. Yeah, she is the sort of person that you don't want to be sitting at the end with you. But does that mean she goes now? Especially if, you know, as Karishma is thinking, especially that means specifically sacrificing this all-female alliance that she was kind of into. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think ultimately, you know, that could have still made it go to Vince. But, you know, if you have Ronnie being kind of pushy about wanting it to be Elaine, you know, yeah. you maybe start feeling like he's the one causing the problem. Right. And the only person who really had any kind of affinity for Ronnie was Aaron. You know, everybody else was like, mm -hmm. okay, he's fine, but they weren't like, they weren't going to go to bat for him. Right. So once you got enough people looking to get rid of him, like the others were just like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. You know? Yeah. So we have, um, let's see. Um, we have Il uh, Vince kind of hears all of that, um, that information. And um, here, here's where I think there might be some missing scenes because it's a little hard to know some of the conversations they have because we have Vince bringing the information to Tom and Elaine, basically saying what they're telling him, which is they are targeting Elaine. And he seems like, he doesn't want that to happen, but he's not sure what they can do about it. And we have Elaine worried she's doomed. Um, she talks about she'll pray to stay, but she seems like she's not really sure what she can do either. Um, uh, and then we have, um, you know, Tom tries to reassure her, you know, to try to keep her from giving up. And then there's a weird thing where Tom tries to go over and talk to them. Like maybe he's going to try to lobby against getting rid of Elaine, but then she kind of comes up also and basically tells them she'll vote for anyone. Um, which, so the question there is, is she really kind of just throwing Vince under the bus there? Or is there some other deeper thing going on 
I felt like in that isolated scene, she was throwing Vince under the bus, but I think they're missing scenes where she felt bad about that rallied and they got everybody motivated, but they weren't necessary for telling the story because mm-hmm. everybody had already pretty much decided Ronnie. Um, but we needed to create drama mm-hmm. and she didn't know like, I feel like there was some reassurance after that of like, hey, like, we really appreciate you being willing to do that. But like, hey, it's Ronnie, you know, like, and then she's being like, oh, God, and I just threw Vince under the bus like that. You will we'll never see that because there's the reassurance that it's Ronnie. Mm-hmm. Well, the the other thing that you, know, like you can see it. I, yeah, so, yeah, uh, so I was going to say once Tribal Council started. Mm-hmm. Once Tribal Council started, like uh, this was not a shocking to me. Like you could hundred mm-hmm. percent tell that everybody was ready to vote for Ronnie. Ronnie thought it was Elaine, and Aaron thought it was Elaine, and he they were they were smug about it, and everybody else was kind of smug in the other way. Like this did not shock me. This was the the most probably maybe the cleanest vote I can remember mm-hmm. outside of when they've telegraphed it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Just from how they behaved in tribal council, at least how I felt. You know? Well, and then the odd thing was, of course, that they didn't, you know, those two guys didn't actually even vote for Elaine. Oh, that's right. They voted for Vince. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I, but um, but uh, I, could, I could tell that it was Ronnie except for them two, and I didn't know what them two were doing. Sorry. Right. I, I, I yeah, jumped. That, yeah. that, that's okay. Uh, the, so I think it, uh, you might be onto something in terms of how that all played out. One possible explanation that I that occurred to me was the idea that if you know, so let's spin out a hypothetical, and obviously the details might be might vary, but let's say that Missy and Karishma are hearing all of this discussion, and they don't want it to be Elaine, but they're also seeing Ronnie be kind of pushy about it, and they're seeing Ronnie being chummy with Aaron. And so maybe they kind of go back around and talk to Tom and Vince and Elaine and say, we actually want to work with you guys. Let's make it be Ronnie. But in order to make sure that happens, we need Ronnie and Aaron to think that their decision of it being either Elaine or Vince is still what's happening. Right. So to play that up, if Elaine, if you can go and basically imply that you're so desperate, you would even vote for Vince. But that raises the question of, do we think Elaine is really sort of up for that sort of uh, subterfuge? Right. So, yeah, I like where that's all going. Like that fits with what we see. Mm -hmm. Where I'm leaning though, is that Elaine not whether she's up for the subterfuge. It just, we haven't seen that she's capable of it yet. She's been well, so genuine and, and like, she's already been so raw and genuine, which is what I, why I said, like, I don't feel like she's going to be any different when we get to day 39, if she's still there when she's stripped down, because she seems pretty raw right now. Yeah. I just don't know that she would, she could deliver as good of a performance as that was mm-hmm. like that felt too real to be fake to try to get them to put, like you said, to put the target on Vince instead of her only so they could all vote for Ronnie. Like that just seemed more complicated than she would be under. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely don't think it would have all been her idea for sure. Um, and I tend, and I tend to agree with, with what you're saying, which is why I question that narrative, but it does occur to me, but what I will point out too, though, is that if we remember that conversation on the beach between Elaine and Ronnie, she was the one that saw through him, not the other way around. Yeah, no, man, maybe we should give her more credit for that. I mean, well, we should probably see, I mean, I think they'll, they might unwind a little bit of that about how that went down without, I mean, obviously they don't show us the scenes, but they might, we might have some discussion, um, you know, especially with Aaron about like, hey, I thought we were on board with Vin. And- well, it does seem like he's mad in the scenes from next time. Right. So we'll we'll have to see how that plays out. Certainly yep. it sounds like something they'll be talking about. But it was a pretty solid, you know, blindside in the sense that it really was, you know, it was everybody versus Aaron and 
Ronnie. Yep. So, you know, so All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. But, uh, so we, we haven't really even talked about the tribal council yet though. So, I mean, um, I said I needed to, but. <laughs> um, yeah. we talked already about Elizabeth. This is the point where she came back to camp, but, uh, we kind of talked about that already. Um, it's she's kind of in a weird position going in where she's kind of scrambled like she's not sure what's going to happen or even what she wants to happen but she can't vote anyway so <laughs> it's a weird yeah. position to be in going to tribal council um i love that boston rob and sandra get to be the peanut gallery um the secret peanut gallery um uh, from from just because you know one of the great pleasures of the back half of any season of survivor is all the reactions from the jury. Right. And so we kind of get that <laughs> up front, but it's a secret. <laughs> like, they're well, hiding get, up there. It's so funny. And we get a little bit longer of an interaction because with the jury, they can't show us too much because they don't want to tip anybody's vote. Mm -hmm. But with them, it doesn't matter. So they can like show them talking and like, mm -hmm discussing what who they, they like what who they don't that's like, who they like who they don't yeah which well and it's impartial or... too because it's you know jury members do are going to vote whereas for them it's just you know it's like eh, interesting yeah um so that's that was fun um uh so in the tribal council we you know we get the whole thing of like the whole thing about oh elaine is so likable but does that make she, her a target um um, Karishma does kind of point out how, you know, this is a example about how likability can be a liability and Rob and Sandra, you know, say she's smart mostly cause that's a good turn of phrase, um, which it is. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly I think, you know, we've, we've ser seen standing out in almost any way on day one can be a liability. Um, but in any event we have, um, I, I liked what Elaine was saying though about how like okay so let's say you you think I'm a threat but you, I'm could be the sort of person the threat you you put get rid of on day twenty not day one so you could just take a pin. <laughs> um, I kind of liked that. Um, and it's hundred percent uh, accurate. Like yeah, yeah. It's like there's no need to get rid of her right away. You know, there, but, and then, you know, I, I don't know if, did Ronnie know he was going, but cause just, it was it, some, a lot of what he said was just strange. Cause like he immediately goes into the whole thing about, oh, well, we don't want to lose a guy and make the tribe weaker. I cannot remember the last time that was the problem in a game of survivor. Oh, we shouldn't have gotten rid of so-and-so now the tribe can't win challenges. When was the last time that actually was the problem for a tribe? I mean, maybe Ozzy, like the first time he played or something like, it's, there was, it, yeah. So I don't know if it was him. It was, there was somebody else that like, yeah, I don't yeah, know. What it was. I mean, it's happened, but it's an exception rather than the right. rule for sure. 100%. 100%. And so, so like the challenge they lost this time, they lost because of the puzzle. They were ahead going into the puzzle, you know, so. Yeah. So maybe we shouldn't lose strong puzzle making people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and you know, so that's, you know, uh, it honestly, was, the way the survivor goes, like if you had to handicap one way or the other, I, I would handicap towards the puzzle makers. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I agree completely because those it's are designed. the ones that always take freaking forever. The rest of the challenge goes by relatively fast. And then the puzzle is the part that takes forever. Right. The puzzle, because it's designed as an equalizer. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. it's meant to be there so that you don't just load up on the biggest, strongest people who aren't that interesting. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. But anyway. So, um, so for Ronnie to sort of pipe up at this point, just to trot out kind of a tired cliche that was maybe not even ever true. Um, well, Ronnie wasn't my favorite. So. No. Um, so, but that was kind of weak. And then, you know, we have Elaine get getting emotional and the rain starts just at the right time. And she talks about, um, you know, thought of going home first and yet she gives a speech. And so my note here is she gives a speech that is actually, actually demonstrating exactly what people are worried about. 
And I mean that only in a positive way, just in the sense of like, I was watching her give that speech and say, oh yeah, she could definitely win a million dollars with a speech like that. Absolutely. You know, I don't think they should get rid of her this time, but yeah, they definitely should be thinking about getting rid of her at some point. Oh, she yeah. could definitely win with, you know, with that kind of a story. Um, and then this, at this point, Ronnie tries to basically somehow say like, yeah, we're the same. And so here's all the jobs that I've had and I will recite them for you in kind of a dry monotone. And they're literally cutting to everybody rolling their eyes at him. Yeah. I think, I think that part of that is that I, I think part of what was going on there is that everyone was already decided, right? So yeah. they're already not listening to him. Um, and I think he may have been picking up on that energy, you know, because even when it happened, even when the vote happened, he didn't seem shocked. He seemed, you know, a little pissed maybe, but not surprised really. Yeah, and I think this is one of the scenes that kind of got to what I was saying is that mm -hmm. going into tribal council, there was still the ambiguity of who might get voted out. Mm hmm by the time they went to vote, I felt like it was pretty obvious what was about to happen. But, you know, and, yeah. and, and things like this, I think, led to that. Yeah. yeah, but it was just such a dramatic contrast between this incredible, emotional, resonant, sincere story from, from Elaine, and then Ronnie says, here's all the weird jobs that I've had, and then Vince kind of tangent, you know, taking a tangent from that and just saying, look, we all have a story, but you know, here's what it means to me. And then he also gets very sincere and kind of emotional too. And, uh, and so it's like, we, you just, you, <laughs> it's just so dramatic that like you got, you have to imagine anyone else sitting there in that group and trying to decide, okay, which of these three people would I prefer to ha leave and not spend any more time with? It's just so, <laughs> so dramatic, uh, difference. Yeah. Um, and then uh, they, you know, Aaron talks about how emotion does matter. It is hard to vote out someone you like. And, you know, it's like it's, you know, he's the one that's saying that because he's actually the one sort of pushing to vote out someone who's more likable in that regard. Um, and then, of course, we get the fun um, bit from, you know, Boston Rob to Sandra is like, was it this hard for you to vote people out? And she's like, no, so, you know, I vote you out and that's it. And so that was kind of fun. Um, and it, it, it is it is kind of just interesting, too, because there has been a trend, I think, not just in the last couple of seasons, but over the last few years of people, you know, like it used to be the whole cliche of I didn't come here to make friends. Right. But I feel like there's been a trend towards more sincere connections with people and being more open to treating, seeing everyone else as a fellow human and having real relationships with them. And that does make it hard to do these things. Whereas like when Sandra played, she was absolutely the ruthless, like, no, none, none of that's getting to me. I'm doing what is best for me strategically. And that is all I'm thinking about. We can be friends after the game's over, <laughs> if you want <laughs> that sort of attitude. And so it's just, it's interesting just her her style of play is different than kind of what has been developing over the last couple of years, I think. So in any event, um, we had the no vote from Elizabeth, which didn't end up having to be shown. Um, uh, and so then, you know, we talked about the votes. And so next time, uh, my note said people are mad about the blind side, but I think it was really kind of just Aaron, right? Because like, no one else no one really else was be mad. Yeah, everyone else knew. Everyone else was on board except Aaron. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's possible that Elizabeth didn't know how it was all playing out because she wasn't Don't there. Worry, she wouldn't be mad though. Yeah. Well, right. Yeah, she wouldn't be <laughs> mad about it. So I think it's mostly just Aaron is mad. Um, um, and then you know, like to his credit, you know, Ronnie is bummed, but he seems pretty clear-eyed about you know what happened. Like he he's not he's not in there going like, oh, they just thought I was threat. You know, he's, he's not, uh, he's not angry at anyone else. Right. He's just disappointed that he kind of like, he didn't, didn't play it as smart as he thought he was. Yeah. So 
Yeah. Yeah. Good for him to at least have that self-awareness uh, going out. So, so we'll see how things continue to develop next time. Uh, and uh, so we'll be back next week, everyone. Thank you for watching and or listening. And we'll be back next week for more Survivor. So try to survive until then. I saw you preemptively smiling because you knew I was going to use the cheesy line again. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Okay.